I would like to start by kind of introducing just a little bit my where I come from, uh, my context, and then I want to talk about three uh, topic lines, let's say, or issues that that I find especially interesting today, and um, I probably can can resonate very much with uh, you, Dustin, what you said in the beginning. How how can we uh, uphold the determinate negation that I will also go into without um, getting. I, in my view now, getting stuck in a negative theology, leaving the field of the discourse and discussion and debate on religion and faith to the side that we are just about to, to um, subject to determinate negation. So there is a kind of a gap here that, um, I don't know, um, that opens and uh, that may, may be today the different starting point for us than um, in comparison at least to the 1920s and 30s and then certainly 40s and after the war. So where do I come from? Uh, I'm, I'm German and uh, American both and um, I am perhaps an outlier and outsider in the field of critical theory. Let me explain but first I want to to say one uh, quick word uh, in memory of Johann Baptist Metz, who is a Catholic theologian who has influenced me uh, quite a bit and who died this week. Um, I mention that because that paves already the way to where I am going. I'm a Catholic theologian and um, also a philosopher and also studied uh, German literature. And uh, since I can breathe uh, philosophically, I must admit that I have read the Frankfurt School. Uh, and that is not a coincidence because I grew up in uh, the Germany of the 1960s and 70s and began uh, did my uh, study years in the 1980s. And that perhaps makes me part of the German generation that is by now called the um, um, generation of the memory culture or so, uh, although that is a new word that we never heard uh, when I grew up. But certainly we were, we were, um, we profited when, when I um, went to school, we profited from the generation of the um, people who had carried on their shoulders the students' revolt of 1968 and many of them actually because that was pretty regular in uh, at the time in Germany, um, study to become teachers. Yeah, that that was the what we call the master's um, uh, degree that um, allowed one to also then go to high schools. And I was in, in exactly when I started high school, let's say 15, 16, when I became interested in philosophical, uh, theological, and literature issues that, that have uh, shaped me, there was a generational change in uh, the German school system and I profited from this first generation of teachers who uh, changed Germany forever. And I think that is part of the reason why finally, finally, uh, there were at least some attempts in Germany to get a grips with uh, the history of Auschwitz and um, the history of uh, Nazism, fascism, and of course it was not over. Um, so I began to study with an eye on the issue of memory. I had heard, because Metz was in Münster, which was close to where I grew up in Germany, I had um, heard already le lectures and it was perhaps the entry point for me and the reason why I actually went into the studies of theology. It was from the start to be a critical theology, taking up <clears throat> some of the themes that the Frankfurt School had addressed in the overall, um, let's say, society, but now looked at through the more particular lens of theology. But I was as much influenced by liberation theology at the time that was the Latin American liberation theology that came um, not only from the, the um, I would even 
say Metzian critical, political, new political theology, as Metz called it, uh, but inspired, of course, <clears throat> by a Marxian uh, critical reading of uh, oppression and revolution and um, doing the opposite side of ideology critique as idolatry critique now constructively uh, turned um, into the liberation of the oppressed people as the, the story of the exodus. Okay, and certainly also turning to the Christian legacy, the crucifixion of Christ as a warning and as um, a sign of identification of all oppressed people who now um, had, at least in their own faith, uh, um, a, a symbolic um, identification in the cross. And that is why you get in liberation theology the the term of the crucified people. So that was all an influence for me. And um, uh, I uh, started to, to study, and perhaps that is for some people a little bit awkward, uh, I studied first Walter Benjamin, then Adorno and Fromm, and in Fromm especially the studies on um, the the social character and um, uh, the his grappling with the uh, Jewish tradition and so on. So I came from a particular perspective. What I want to bring to the table today are perhaps two themes that have been uh, probably occupying me for for most most of my time um, that I have been studying. So the one is uh, the notion of the subject. Now, subject identity turning into, in the third generation of the Frankfurt School, uh, Axel Honneth in a um, more thorough attention to intersubjectivity. Now, one one uh, can read the whole history of philosophy, perhaps from that perspective, but I do believe that the first generation of the Frankfurt School that I'm still mostly aligned with, I must say, uh, addresses the question of, of the subject in a very particular way, and it is sometimes forgotten, and um, that is the question how can we how can we address the question of the subject and identity without losing sight of the non identity that that cannot be reified that that cannot be identified that that cannot be externalized so some some theories have turned especially phenomenology to embodiment or a Leiblichkeit in Germany or in, um, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, the, the, the embodied self or something uh, that, that comes pretty close to the non-identity problem in, in uh, this respect. But I do believe from today's perspective what has intrigued me for a very long time is actually the Hegelian concept of recognition that I believe must be rescued from Hegel. Uh, so what, I, what I'm what i busy with in my own work is to try to learn the lessons from the first generation of um, the Frankfurt School and still retrieve a concept of intersubjectivity that is centered on mutual mutual recognition. I do not believe that the interpretation that Axel Honneth has provided us with is um, the end point. I believe it is the starting point, and uh, I do believe that it has to be um, read critically or subjected to the perhaps the the um, another kind of negative dialectic. Uh, in response to that recognition theory. But from today's perspective, I believe that we still cannot just dismiss it and discard it, but our job would be to uh, actually turn to this question of intersubjectivity again and see how the non-identity that, that cannot be recognized, the unrecognizable, 
uh, dimension or um, element in in the mutual recognition. Now, coming from from the critical theory perspective, I would say that um, the determinate negation that I want to apply here means that I actually am much more interested in misrecognition, reification, disrespect, dehumanization than in teasing out what mutual recognition could could look like, what it could mean, how it could be stabilized and so on. I think that is the lesson I have learned from Adorno's negative dialectic that um, uh, Hegel might might have been carried away by his by not only by his um, urgent desire to to create a system, but actually by his desire for reconciliation. And maybe it is a little bit too early for us to do that, and maybe it is uh, more urgent for us to to stick to the critique of misrecognition. So I do not deny that the theory of subject, the theory of intersubjectivity seen through the lens of recognition is very important, but my critical turn to that is, and Honneth certainly has done so too, but in a different way than I would uh, like to do that, um, through the lens of critical theory means to turn to misrecognition and what differs or what separates me, I think, from Honneth is that I want to want to tease out a little bit more what the the non-identity in mutual recognition could look like and how the non-identity is exactly the thing that is being misrecognized. So a kind of a reification um, that takes place and we have uh, Franz Fanon and, and many others who have actually provided us with, with the best possible reading of misrecognition, the asymmetric recognition that, that is still, um, or misrecognition that, that is still masked, masked as recognition. That is not the way we can uh, work. But I do believe that within this, this notion of what I call the, the topic line of the subject, we are not only um, called to, to rework um, the the notion of misrecognition and recognition with attention to non-identity, but also the the um, underlying thread of human freedom. And what I have learned in my own tradition is that freedom uh, cannot only be uh, considered as a transcendental concept and uh, it cannot only be considered as as a kind of a political ethical concept but it must be it must be tied to the concept of liberation one part of the freedom concept brings in a dynamic a, a kind of a drive from oppression to liberation and that is what i do not only take from marx of course but also from liberation theology so that is the first topic line can I can I add maybe a little bit shorter my two other um, topic lines? The the second uh, issue uh, that has really really um, haunted me, I think, from early on, is the question of history, and I believe that the Frankfurt School, the early Frankfurt School, mm. is perhaps best known not only for their for their critique of positivism and sociology, certainly from a philosophical and theolo theological perspective, their philosophy of history is uh, one of the central issues that, that I am interested in, at least. And there are two ways to, to um, deal with it. So in my second topic line that I'm interested in is I, I turn it a little bit to the question of the finite and the infinite, if you like, or history and transcendence, uh, whatever uh, we may call it. But um, I do believe that there is no critical theory unless unless there is in whatever way the other side to it. So, Professor Siebert, you have you have certainly, uh, in my reading, at least taken this perspective. What is it the 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 other um, or the, the holy other, das ganz andere, um, the other side of history that ends history. And whatever figures we may find for that, I think for me, 
turning to uh, the Frankfurt School on religion and theology, I, I believe they are a reminder within contemporary philosophy that if we lose out of sight, whether, whether as uh, believers or agnostic or atheists or so, that doesn't matter, it is the conceptual um, theory that I'm interested in. If we lose out of sight uh, the concept of transcendence or the infinite, whatever we call it, uh, from a theological perspective, I would call it the divine, then we do not have any uh, possibility to to actually find a standpoint of critique. And that matters because it is my understanding of um, the gap between the slaughterhouse of history, as, as Hegel would have said that, and um, the other side of it. Now, negative theology would certainly say, and we don't know, we don't know what the divine is. Christianity takes a different, a different take on that. But for me, first and foremost, looking at the philosophy of history in the early um, Frankfurt School tradition means that I have, I, I gain a perspective that allows me to see the mythos, the myth, the mythologization of political um, institutions, political arrangements, political regimes um, being deified, as you would say, just Dustin, or um, I, I would say uh, the establishment of political theology and the understanding of, of Karl Schmidt that, however, has, has been a uh, signature of Western uh, Christianity. And I believe that the Makuza, for example, or from um, uh, Horkheimer in part, but they actually allow us to, to analyze this history from that point of view. And so in that respect, I am not even as interested as in my first topic line with a theory of subject and then recognition. Here, when I turn to the philosophy of history and uh, the distinction between, let's say, the finite and the infinite, uh, the history and the other of history, I'm interested in the analyses because I still believe that on the one hand side, the authoritarian character character that is tied to the subject theory now becomes the authoritarian regimes that require a leader, that require obedience, and that are very, very much mirrored on a particular political theological story that can be found in biblical texts, but moreover in early modern, especially early modern, uh, Christian texts, yeah, whether it is Catholic um, political theology or, moreover, I must say, the Protestant um, and Calvinist um, American side of uh, political theology. We get a lot of material analyses, conceptual tools to demythologize this kind of call it deification. Uh, with Benjamin, I would say the the transformation of history into myths. And that is naturalization, naturalizing them. Um, and for me, it is very important because I am a Catholic theologian. I'm a theologian. I'm a Christian theologian, and I have to, I have to apply critical theory to my own tradition. And unfortunately, I get a lot of material, a lot of material. Okay, the authoritarian Christian theology is life and well. And um, whereas there might have been hope over the last few decades that this understanding of theology might be really transformed into uh, an understanding of a prophetic theology that has not been the case. And I think we are at a moment in history where, um, especially in, in Western Europe and in, in the US where I live, uh, that we have to urgently, urgently turn to these analyses. So that is my second line. The notion of history, political theology, holding holding the space, let's say, for understanding transcendence or the infinite, the other, 
what I call the divine. Now that brings me to my three, my third topic line, because in Benjamin, and I learned it from Benjamin more than from anybody else, there is a connection, a constructive reading that Adorno maybe doesn't have so much, but Benjamin has it, um, that, that um, aligns divine, the reading of the divine with a divine justice rather than divine law. So I get a juxtaposition of a mythologized reading of political theology and I get a political theology that actually liberation theology and Johann Baptist Metz sensed immediately. It is the, the connection of the divine that is transcendent <coughs> absolutely with the notion of justice. And now I get, and I can even see that in the Jewish tradition um, with the two terms of the Mispat and the um, uh, Sadikia, yeah, uh, the legal justice and, and the moral justice, that I can do that, the law and, and justice, Recht und Gerechtigkeit in German, um, that I, I can distinguish within the, the theological tradition, the divine law that goes into the authoritarian political theology direction and divine justice that has a completely different starting point. The divine justice is, in my understanding, not a top-down justice, but it is the justice that ties the Exodus story to the compassionate God and suffering with the people who are oppressed and calling for justice. It's not the merciful God that pardons the sinner in history. It is the compassionate God, and the words are exactly the same. Rahami can be translated as misericordia in that sense, as mercy, or as compassion, or as pity. There are many different words for that. Mitleid, Mitgefühl, Barmherzigkeit, they all have the same root, but they go immediately into two directions. The one is the mercy, and the other one is the compassion that is in Hebrew, the rahamim, is pain in the gut. And it is feminine. Okay? So there is not this, <laughs> this patriarchal divine ruler. There is actually the hurting God regarding the pain of others calling for justice. And that is tied in Benjamin's reading of the critique of violence in this essay. This is my interpretation, but not only mine, is a divine justice that brings us to the notion of theodicy, of hope, the apocatastasis. Will there be a reckoning and justice at the end of history, at the other side of history, where the injustices in history will be remembered now, this justice concept, this history concept, this theological divine justice concept, in my reading at least, is ethical. Ethical at its core, it calls us to remember, as Benjamin says in, in uh, the thesis on history, we can only remember in fragments. On this day, like a prophet, he says that, on this day, at the last day, the fragments will come together. But that is not what we can do. All we can do is remember ethically, we are summoned by all past generations who have been treated unjust. Now, I can tie that now. All, everyone and all the generations who have been dehumanized, humiliated, misrecognized, and so on. So all of a sudden, this attention to the misrecognition to others brings us back to the subject line that I was um, alluding to in the beginning, to the transcendence that is the other side of history, but now it has an ethical line that, that we can discern and it becomes a summons to our identity that in my reading, I'm an ethicist, in my reading uh, can inform our moral identity. So there are many things that we can take from the tradition of moral philosophy, from Kant, from Hegel, and from others. But I do believe that, that it is at the end of the day, 
in this respect, it is Benjamin who who actually is the clearest about the tying of the ethical summons and the theological, because this is the origin, this is the reason for hope. 